All right. <clears throat> so five, four, three, two, one. All right, folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am very excited to have as my guest today, Dr. Glenn Doyle. Glenn, welcome. It is a pleasure to be with you, Dr. Guy. <laughs> Appreciate that. So Dr. Doyle has extensive clinical experience in inpatient, outpatient, and consultation settings. He's presented multiple times at the annual conference of the ISS TD, International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, as well as the American Psychological Association. Dr. Doyle got into psychology because as a teenager, he became deeply fascinated with the self-help movement as well as literature. And as a professional, has made it his mission to bring the techniques and research base of clinical psychology to the personal empowerment paradigm of self-help. Glenn, welcome. Thank you so much. So before we get going here, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Where I'm from originally is I grew up in Iowa, here in in, in the heartland, and um, went to graduate school in in Washington D.C. and that's actually where I started my my career um, as a as a trauma focused psychologist out in D.C. and I'm still licensed in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, and in 2015, I uh, moved the whole operation or the heart of the operation anyway, here to uh, Chicago, Illinois. So uh, I'm primarily based here in Chicago, but uh, I, I also have a client base in, in DC. And, um, you know, I also like at this point, you know, I now do uh, consultation work with uh, folks uh, nationally and, and, and recently internationally as well. So Awesome. Awesome. All right, Glenn, let's dive in here. How the heck did this start for you? Share that story. <laughs> Depends on what we're talking about when we, when we say this. Um, you know, if we're talking about um, psychology generally and, and, and getting into psychology, let alone trauma therapy, like I didn't actually know, but all of these things from very early in my life were kind of snowballing and conspiring to kind of move me toward this, the work that I do now, working mostly with trauma and addictions. Um, you know, so I grew up with uh, a, a really intense, really intelligent, really brilliant father. Um, and the expectations for me were were super, super high. My dad was this brilliant guy. He started businesses and he was super, super charismatic and uh you know, but like be, being his son came with its own set of of expectations. Um, kind of the dark side of that, you know, was that uh, he also had a serious uh, addiction problem, and so my life growing up was was really kind of ducking and dodging and weaving between all of the life obstacles mm. that you don't even know are obstacles at the time. For for you, it's just life. Like I talk to a lot of my folks now and they say, man, I didn't realize that when I was growing up in these environments that we would now call traumagenic, like I didn't realize there was anything weird about that. That was just life. And that's what it was like for me too. This was just life, you know, growing up in a house where there was a, uh, you know, serious uh, addiction problems fed into like a, a school based experience where uh, I was just getting bullied mercilessly. And again, I didn't realize that was a, uh, anything out of the ordinary. You know, I kind of thought that, man, this is just life. Sometimes mm -hmm. it sucks. Mm -hmm. um, I can look back now and really see that, uh, you know, uh, dealing with the, uh, you know, the behavior of my dad at home and and trying to kind of live the life that I was trying to live at school um, were really uh, formative experiences for me. And by the time I was uh, uh, an adolescent, um, I had a, a develop a real serious depression problem, um, you know, up to and including suicide, suicidal ideation, um, and kind mm -hmm. of half-assed suicide attempts. Um, I had also really developed a, uh, a a personality style that lent itself to addiction. Again, at the time, I didn't really know what that was, because gosh, I wasn't cool enough to be uh, to be using any of the substances that you, that you, that you think of as as substances of, of addiction. I was never invited to parties, so I never got the chance to drink. That said, I uh, was behaving in in kind of these these very uh, what I now know are addict ways uh, with with other substances and other behaviors. So anyway, I wind up as as an adolescent, just miserable, miserable. So let me, and, if I may, so any yeah. did you receive any help up to this point? Did anyone, an adult, jump in and say, Glenn, you know, maybe you should talk to some anything like that? 
So it's funny you should ask um, <laughs> because so part of my experience um, uh, in, in grade school um, was I was um, uh, sexually abused by a, a male babysitter. And a few years after it happened, um, I told about it. And by this time, like the guy had moved away and, and there was really no accountability that could happen for the guy. But uh, sure, my parents actually got me in to see a counselor. And I remember being there um, thinking, you know, gosh, this thing that had happened with the babysitter, um, like I, I knew it was supposed to have been traumatic for me. But I remember thinking, gosh, of the things that are making me unhappy, that's like, that's that's not even high on the list, guy. Mm -hmm. And yet that's what the guy was asking about. That's what the counselor was asking about. So I do remember having a few sessions with this guy and to my recollection, and I was pretty young, like at this point, I was probably in about fourth grade or so. And I remember having the experience of like, well, gosh, I think those sessions ended because there really wasn't anywhere to go with it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I don't think he quite knew what to do with me, nor did I really have, to my recollection, again, this is a long time ago, nor did I really have any, uh, no one had really sat me down and said, this is what we're doing. Like, this is what therapy is. Like, this is, you know, this is how it works. This is how you can, this is what you can bring to it, et cetera, et cetera. Fast forward to um, when I was a teenager and I started to get interested in self-help. You know, like, so I started to, uh, you know, I, I kind of wandered into the, the self-help aisle of Barnes and Noble. You know how, how you kind of wander into the self-help aisle and you hope nobody sees you. You kind of you look around <laughs> furtively. Right. <laughs> so I started reading self-help books. And so I got the idea in my head that, well, maybe there was something here. Like, like maybe, you know, this wasn't just all me sucking, you know, maybe I'd had some experiences and maybe I had some challenges, you know, some obstacles. Right. Um, and yet at the time, so I remember I asked for my birthday for my 16th birthday, I asked my parents for a self-help book as I want, as a present, I, I, I wanted to, it was a, it was a Tony Robbins book, but I was interested. And so it was like, yeah, okay. I had the self-help book for my birthday. And I'm, I remember my parents just got it for me and didn't ask any questions. And I'm, I, and I remember thinking at that point, or at least in retrospect, I remember thinking, gosh, if you're, you know, for his 16th birthday, if your kid asks for a self-help book, right. maybe you'd get curious, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, like maybe you just ask some questions. Like, so, so kid, yeah, right. Um, I think that kind of sent the message to me that, well, wow, I really am on my own here. Um, mm. you know, I really am you know, kind of in a position of having to put together any kind of recovery I'm going to have on my own. I do remember when I was a junior in high school, having a uh, an anxiety attack at school. Um, and I was, uh, you know, I was I was hyperventilating. You know, I, I know now that I've been triggered and, and, and I was having a bit of a trauma response. But at the time, I had no idea what was going on. Like I'm gasping like a fish out of water and they hauled me down to the to the nurse's office and eventually they got an ambulance. They brought me to the hospital. And my parents did show up. My, my recollection is they were furious because they had to come from work. Like, what is this drama queen doing now, right? Like, what is this kid, this dramatic kid? You know, what, we have to interrupt our day, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of arguing with themselves about like kind of who is to blame for this, you know, and and, and here I just wanted to shrink. In the, and I remember being in the hospital, but I just wanted to shrink like, oh my God, what have I done? They, they did get me into uh, into therapy. Um, but, the, but the therapy was, again, it was focused on, well, Glenn is the problem in the family. Like, and, I, and I remember that vividly. Like I was kind of, you know, we, we know this term identified patient, right? Like I was the identified patient. Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't in, in treatment for uh, my recollection is a, a few months because I, it wasn't a year because I, I remember, I remember what classes I was taking when it started. And I remember what classes I was taking when it stopped. Um, so again, off and on, it, it, it's not, it, it's not the case that there was no help. It is the case that there was help that, um, I didn't know how to how to really utilize. Um, it's also the case, I will tell you this, that whenever help was was offered, like whenever, like at school, they would do awareness exercises, right? And they'd say, Well, man, if you ever have thoughts of hurting yourself, you know, you know, kind of come to us and, and, mm -hmm. and talk to us and whatever. I remember having the thought, there is no way, there is no way I would do that. Are mm -hmm. you kidding? I'll be in trouble. I, I vividly remember my parents arguing when I had the panic attack. I'm like, you get in trouble if you tell anybody, mm -hmm. right? 
So in response to your question, this is a long answer to a short question, but in response to your question, sure, there was help, but man, was it uh, really complicated to access or to utilize in any way. I really appreciate you sharing all that. And it just sounds um, like you were put into this trauma maze where there really was no escape. You know, even the help wasn't really sufficient. Um, and in fact, kind of turned on you even more. Um, so how do things unfold such that you say to yourself, all right, I want to start pursuing this. So, well, it, it's, it's really relevant to, to how you just framed that guy, the, you know, the, the fact that even when help was available, um, it, it even, it, it felt more dangerous to access it. I actually talk to a lot of people now who feel that way about um, engaging the mental health system is that they, you know, like a lot of people have the experience of, man, you get just a little too honest with a therapist and you find yourself in the hospital or, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, it very much felt that way for me. And, and ironically, where I actually found um, some semblance of connection and some semblance of understanding was in those self-help books that I was reading. I mean, I think there's a number of reasons for that. You know, one, I was accessing them on my terms and um, I was accessing them at my pace and many of the better self-help books. And at this point, I've, you know, like, like at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm board president of an organization that is, you know, that, that works with, uh, you know, accountability and transparency in the self-help industry. So like, I've read a lot of self-help books at this point. But the better self-help books um, very often included uh, stories, you know, from the author's life, mm-hmm. and I really connected with that. That turned into a real source of strength, and and I say without exaggeration that um, you know those books probably saved my life at some point because it did give me this this it planted the seed of an idea that okay if he figured it out you know if this guy was in this position he figured it out. Well, then maybe I can figure it out too. Don't know how, right? Mm-hmm. But if this situation existed, um, you know, maybe I can figure that out too. Um, it's one of the reasons why now, as a therapist, you know, I'm very big on bringing our own personal experience to the table and 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 how we work. You know, because I think part of what was happening was anytime a therapist did work with me, they were. Uh, hitting technique really hard, right? Maybe mm-hmm. they were doing you know good therapy, but what I needed was that <laughs> idea that that this is possible for real people to do this and get through. It. And that's what I got from the self help books, wow. right? So, um, so I was always very into the self help books, even uh, as I kind of careened into uh, what turned out to be an initially uh, disastrous attempt at college, right? So I'm a kid who, who grew up with, with real self-esteem wounds. And um, I think that, you know, gosh, how am I going to solve the self-esteem problem? My first college major, I was a music major because I was going to be a rock and roll star. I'm going to get myself a job guy where at the end of my job, people stand up and say, yay. And then they <laughs> buy your CD. That was how I was going to fix my self-esteem problem. And this made perfect sense to me at the time. I was so terribly depressed. And, and and what ended up happening was I got a, a few months into my college career where I, I just collapsed and, and I went into a, a major depressive episode. I stopped going to school, essentially, oh. um, went into a, a really, really dark place. I dropped out of school, um, wound up doing things like uh, <laughs> like playing piano in places for money. Like I was the piano man with the the with the glass on the piano. You know, I I, I played dinner theater for a while, you know. To make ends meet, but the point is, I was in this really, really dark place. Finally, got to a place where um, I remembered the self help books that that had really got me through as a teenager. So at this point, I'm in my early twenties, mm-hmm. and I thought to myself, you know, gosh, maybe I can revisit those. And I was lucky enough to stumble upon. I still remember the day I, I, I stumbled upon an old dog-eared copy of Feeling Good by by uh, David Burns. Like the old book about about CBT, it's like CBT for the masses, feeling good by David Burns. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess, I guess I'll try it. Mm-hmm. Not only did that kind of mark the beginning of my turnaround, but that also planted the idea in my head of you know how back in the day the idea had been planted in my head that maybe you can survive this. Well, this planted the idea in my head is like, well, maybe, 
you can do something like these people did in helping other people. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can make the focus of your career, your life, being there for people in ways that you needed someone to be there by, like 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 you needed, right? Um, so in short order, um, I kind of righted the ship. I went right back to school. I burned through a, a, an undergraduate psychology degree in about two and a half years. Like that's how motivated I was. I went summers and stuff. I um, went to uh, to graduate school in Washington, D.C. And when I was in uh, D.C., I was lucky enough. Like I already had this idea of, of, man, the kind of work that I wanted to do and the kind of patients I wanted to work with. Um, I was lucky enough to get a job at the Psychiatric Institute of Washington, which happened to have a, uh, a, a an inpatient unit devoted to the treatment of complex um, uh, trauma and dissociative disorders, right? So I was very lucky to get exposed to the fact that, man, not only can you do this kind of work, but here's how you do it. Mm -hmm. Here are people who are actually doing it. And here are people who are doing it with some of the uh, the patients who are in the you know the the worst possible space. Like like if you're being admitted to an inpatient unit, man, you're you're having rough times. Mm -hmm. So again, I was lucky enough to after uh, you know getting into this groove of this is what I want to do, having some really great modeling. So again, it's I I often say that you know man, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm in now. Um, without having been just stupidly lucky, you know, and 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 not just liking the things that have happened to me, which I am, but also stupidly stupidly lucky to have had the the role models that I've had. Some of them don't even know that they're role models. Mm -hmm. so, um, well, again, I mean, I, I I think you you're articulating your whole process beautifully and in a really inspiring way, and you know, I want to second your sentiment about the importance of uh, bringing your own story or one's own story to this whole uh, process and platform, because th that's what I hope my podcast is about. So already as, as you're talking, Glenn, I'm thinking, all right, I've got to have this guy back on again, <laughs> Ser sincerely. I mean, this is what it's about. Um, but how how talk a little bit more if 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 you could how you made that jump to say you know what i want to help others sure so again i talked so much about the the importance of of modeling and one of my earliest models was um you know as i noted that uh, the self help kind of pioneer superstar anthony robbins i know that he's kind of a controversial figure but believe me, being involved in the nonprofit work I am now, I know he's a very controversial figure. But something that really struck me about Tony Robbins' story was that he didn't really crawl out of the hole that he was in until he was able to envision a life of meaning. Um, and for him, it happened to be, well, man, I know the resources that I might have needed the resources that might have been helpful to me once upon a time that just weren't there. Um, you know, maybe I can be that person for somebody else. It really goes back to uh, if you're familiar with uh, Victor Frankel, mm -hmm. man's search for meaning. So mm -hmm. Victor Frankel is in this unbelievably unfortunate position of being in a concentration camp. And Victor Frankel, uh, a psychiatrist, like he gets really interested in the question of like, well, what makes the difference between the prisoners who survive and the prisoners who don't? He comes up with this really interesting observation. He says, man, it seems to be those prisoners who have, who can conjure some sense of meaning, who can assign some sense of meaning to what otherwise might just be this, this awful nonsensical experience, that there is something to that that has survival value. And Frankel in Man's Search for Meaning talks about this, about, about how very often the meaning that prisoners assigned to this awful experience they were having. It's like, well, man, the meaning I'm going to assign to this is I need to get through this so I can so I can tell the world about it so it will never happen again. Likewise, Tony Robbins' meaning was that, you know, I need to, uh, to learn everything I can about human behavior so I can go on and help other people, right? Mm -hmm. That's going to be my meaning. When I take a look at what gets me out of bed in the morning and what really motivates me and, you know, Motivation has has always been a, a problem for me. So in addition to these other things I was struggling with, 
you know, for years, I had no idea I had a bad case of ADHD. Um, part of what uh, ADHD entails is what we call executive dysfunction and 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 behavior uh, initiation, motivation, right? Terribly hard time just getting motivated. That's why it's one of the reasons why I need these really vivid models in front of my eyes of like, well, man, this is what this could be. You know, this mm-hmm. is what this could possibly be, right? Um, so. Th- Having again these these really vivid examples of like man, Victor Frankl found meaning in in telling the world about it, and Tony Robbins found meaning in being there in ways that that other people that 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 he needed people to be for other people. When I think about what gets me out of bed in the morning and what uh, what motivates me to do the the things that I do to 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 write the tweets and to write the blogs and I mean let alone work with the patients, etc. I think you know, man. If all that was available, if all that is available is the kind of help that I got from perfectly well-intended people, mm-hmm. right? And like I, I totally believe a counselor who I saw when I was a kid, like God bless him, he was probably doing his best. Um, then, then people are again, they're not going to get the help they need. So that's again, that's that's what gets me out of out of bed in the morning when I write my tweets. You know, so so most of the material I do um, in, in terms of of you know, writing blogs, writing other things and, 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 and doing appearances and stuff. Most of them start, like I kind of work out my ideas as tweets mm-hmm. first. So if you follow my Twitter, you're getting the rough draft of this mm-hmm. idea that I have, right? But most of my ideas that start out with tweets, like, huh, I envision the person who was me. Mm. Like I envision the person who is struggling with their trauma recovery, right? And I have this whole thing that, that I feel so strongly about is that, you know, in the trauma treatment world, um, I, I feel that we tend to get really enamored of trauma therapy. Like we get really interested in the therapy because we're the therapist. We get really interested in what, what we do, right? Mm-hmm. I get really interested since I come from the experience that I come from. I get really experienced and I get really interested in the experience of recovering. Like therapy happens an hour a week. Mm-hmm. Recovery is 24-7, 365. So I think about that person who is struggling with recovering, and they're struggling with, are they going to self-harm today, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, are they going to get out of bed today? Are they going to go to work? I don't know, right? Um, and they open up their, you know, their social media app. You know, is there a, a nugget of an idea that I can plant there? That idea is, is, is really interesting and cool to me that I can plant that idea, much like ideas were planted in my head. And I know it's possible because I had that experience. Mm. That's a really interesting uh, reversal in a sense. Uh, you know, therapy is taking place an hour a week. Recovery is taking place, uh, filling filling the gaps and all that other time. My gosh. Um, you know, you're clearly on a mission, right? Let me just remind everyone quickly that I'm speaking with Dr. Glenn Doyle. Um, you're, you're, you're on a mission to what? <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 on a mission to save the me who once was mm. is, is, is what first occurs to me when 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 you say that i'm on a mission to be there so i have a whole shtick that i do about how you know look it's, i mean it's nothing new it's if you've done any kind of inner child work you know you know that 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 we carry with us the 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 us that we once were right the kid we once were we carry that kid with us inside our head and inside our heart and a big task of trauma recovery is to make the inside of our head and the inside of our heart a safe place for that kid. And I'm still doing that work now, right? So part of um, rescuing the me who once was, part of taking care of him, you know, part of the care and maintenance of that that kid I once was, who I still carry around with me, is to help other people, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think part of what that kid inside needs, at least speaking from my own kid inside, I think part of what that kid inside needs is to know that there are people who see them, who see that, man, the, the, the resources that are available are problematic. And again, it's it's not even necessarily anybody's fault. They just are. It's complicated to reach out for help. So again, I think of it like in, in terms of a mission, like so I'm helping other people and I'm, and I'm blessed to be able to do that but really what am i doing really what I'm, I'm taking care of that kid who who i once was like like you know the fact that i make these resources available um you know another th- thing that i do is like so here in my practice in chicago um i i 
make lots and lots of uh, therapy opportunities available at, uh, at at either low or no cost and whatnot. That's another piece of it, mm-hmm. right? Um, but really, what are we always trying to do? We're always trying to save and nurture and and uh, keep safe. You know that that kid inside. I mean, we're all we're all really working our own recovery. Like everything you see of me, like I'm working my own recovery. Of course, I am. Mm-hmm. And, what do you feel that kid needed? You know, if if you could turn back the clock in a sense, what would you have had that initial therapist do or say that would have allowed you as a young kid to be seen and or heard? So that's an interesting question because what what first leaps to my mind was that uh, I wish that I'd had, how to put this, I wish that I'd had someone frame the problem to me or the situation to me in such a way that, you know, look, this project of finding, we'll call it happiness, because that's how kids think, right? This project of finding happiness and of not being miserable, let alone healing from from an experience that you might have had. This is a large project. This is a project that begins when you get up in the morning, right? Um, and and it extends far beyond this hour. I wish that I'd had that that uh, that therapist. I'm kind of glad I don't remember his name because I feel that like in all these interviews, I toss him under the bus and it's, it's really not his fault, but, but I wish I'd had somebody um, sit me down and say, you know, look, you know, I get a, a limited amount of time with you, but you're with you 24 seven. So that relationship with you, your relationship with you, that's the one you got to work on. Mm. That's the one that needs to be made safe. That's the one that needs to be, you know, uh, productive. Right. Um, I think that we do our best work as as therapists. And mind you, there are all sorts of different types of therapists and all sorts of different types of therapy. I'm not a snob and says, you know, like it has to be done this way. I do think that as a general principle, though, like we as therapists are the most effective when we are acknowledging straight up the limitations of of any possible work that we can do. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wish I'd had that that uh, that therapist say, you know, look kid you're you're up against it um you don't know it but you're up against it genetically mm-hmm. you're up against it environmentally you're up against it with this this abusive experience that you had right and you're gonna be up against it every minute that you're awake so this is a large project i am here to help you and i'm not the only one here to help you you're gonna find god if i'd only die if i'd only had somebody frame it to me like you know look I, as the therapist, and not the only resource you're ever going to have, um, you know, you're going to find characters in books and characters in movies and and musicians and poetry mm. and, and various things out there in the world that are going to help you, that are going to be your secret weapons, mm. right? It's kind of an abstract answer to 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 a very concrete question of like what should he have said? But man, like I really think of you know a, a model I really admire. Um, you know, again, having dealt also with, uh, you know, some of my own, um, addiction issues, right. A model I really admire, uh, or is the 12 step model, even though I know that, uh, you know, like the 12 step model has its, has its advantages, its disadvantages. It's not for everybody, but something I really like about it is the sponsorship model. Mm-hmm. This idea that, okay, you're going to have a sponsor, um, your sponsor, yeah, you can call them when you're in a jam. They're, they're, they're kind of part mentor. They're kind of part coach. They recognize the limitations. They're not a therapist, right? But they're kind of, but they've been there. Most importantly, they've been there. They have some sober time, right? right? So they know how you're going to get through this. They know how they got through this. And they know they can't, it's possible to get through it. You bet. Yeah. You bet. Let me, I, I can tell you a story just real quick. Um, of course. I remember once my family was um, vacationing in Hawaii and I was probably, um, I was probably in my twenties and, 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 and we were in Hawaii and, and we were doing this uh, among the activities that, that we were doing, we were doing these, these dune buggies driving through this, this jungle in Hawaii. It was very beautiful. And we stopped at one point at a, uh, it was this beautiful 
lagoon with a with a waterfall and we were swimming in the water and stuff and our our tour guide as we were swimming in the water our tour guide says you know look i i tell this to all the tourists and he points to the waterfall and he says you know look if you can if you can swim up to the waterfall like the current is really strong as the closer you get to the waterfall but if you can swim up to the waterfall and touch the rock then that's 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 the challenge can you do that and so like my brother and I are trying to do it. We're swimming and we're trying to touch it. And eventually, eventually we, we do it. He says, okay. He says, that's one challenge. He says, the other challenge is if you can climb the waterfall, like through the, through the spray, right? He says, I've been doing, I've been a, a tour guide here for 12 years and, and, you know, hundreds of, of, of tourists, only seven have done that. And I got it in my head and, 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 and you know, we, we try it, we get knocked off the thing. But I get it in my head. I'm like, seven have done it. Seven have done it. That means it's doable. That means there's some way, you know, that there, that there are the footholds and the handholds there. There's some way to do this. Flash forward to for the next several hours, I held up, I held everybody up. For the next several hours, I spent trying to climb this damn waterfall. Oh my God. After everyone else gave up, and I'm getting and I'm getting my butt kicked, I'm getting tossed back into the lagoon again and again wow. and again. Um, one of the other people on the tour, um, you know, says to uh, um, uh, my my girlfriend at the time was along with us. It said to my girlfriend, he's, he's got to give up, and she goes, "Oh no, oh no, he doesn't do that <laughs> <laughs> because he knows there's a way up now." And eventually, you get a little, you get a little higher, you get a little higher. Eventually, I made it to the top of of the waterfall, and I remember. And it, I'm exhausted and I'm you know, wow. looking looking at everybody down on the shore. Who do you think I looked at? The one person I looked at. Of course, I look at my dad. My dad has his sunglasses on. He's looking the other way. Wow. And I'm like, man, what a <laughs> what, what a perfect metaphor for, for so many things. But my point is, what made the difference? Um, it made the difference that I knew it could be done. Like once mm-hmm. you know it could be done, that's one of the reasons why. Like I used to have with my 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 former mentor, and I used to go back and forth all the time about the value of of um, being open about our lived experiences as survivor. And she was a very traditional um, um, traditional therapist with like, well, you know, look, that's 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 not our role. Like it's going to contaminate the the transference and 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 it opens us up for countertransference and 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 we we can't and we never did agree on that because mm-hmm. I really feel that one of the things now of course you need to be very clear about why you're doing it. You need to be really clear about your boundaries with it and and you know it always needs to be guided by a clinical rationale. But one of the reasons why I always speak in terms of we like if you look at anything I write, I write in terms of we. I never say, mm-hmm. you know, this is what you will experience, and this is what mm-hmm. we experience as survivors, is because that that flips that switch of it's possible. Yeah, amazing, um, awesome story. My God, look, Glenn, um, gotta have you back. Uh, just super, super excited. Uh, uh, I met you and we we connected, but um, very very powerful. I mean, really powerful. When uh, or rather, how can people get in contact with you? Um, so my my blog is at useyourdamnskills.com. Uh, my my website, uh, my practice website is at realisticlifechange dot com but uh, i am i'm most visible out there on uh, on twitter and instagram and we have a really great uh, community on on facebook okay so if you look up dr glenn patrick doyle he is a just i used to say just dr glenn doyle but then i always got confused with the self-help person glennon doyle there's a self-help writer named glennon doyle i'm like what are the odds what are the odds <laughs> that not only would there be a writer but a self-help writer named glennon doyle Right. But if you look up Glenn Patrick Doyle, uh, my my screen name is Doctor Doyle says on all of the things you'll you'll find me. I'm around. Awesome, awesome. Appreciate it. Well, look uh, again. Great meeting you. Thank you so much for taking the time, and uh, we'll be in touch. It is my pleasure, guy. Thank you so much. All right. Take care.